One never knows who all is going to show and uh, be part of an event, and so I'm glad you're all here. Tomorrow, Zion is commemorating its 125 years, and John D. Roth is our guest for us. He arrived at Portland around noon. It took a while to get south because of the traffic. But I see this empty block of time, and I just think it can't be wasted. <laughs> <laughs> and should the Historical Society make some use of this? So the board says, sure, so this is what we've done. Nothing fully structured, but let's talk about some of the things that John has a wide interest in. And so we can, we can jump to a lot of things. For me, I think the first introduction I may have had to you, John, is in these two books, Beliefs mm -hmm. and Practices. Mm -hmm. We were part of a congregation for almost 20 years, nearly, and um, we had people coming who came from no faith background and some from other faith backgrounds, and who were Mennonites. I thought this in a very easy way, help people to understand who we are, and so those I was using, and of course stories are so much fun, and we have a woman at Zion now who's come to us from another faith tradition. She was in here talking to Carolyn. What shall I read? What do I learn to know? Because as she's part of the Bible study, she's discovering some things a bit in contrast with her own um, rather conservative evangelical upbringing. So she's searching and feeling at home, mm -hmm. which we're really pleased about. Yeah. So I think it's just open to say, how have you had your interests? I think I had this book once upon a time. I don't know whether in downsizing I still have it, but the Amish, the letters from the Amish division, that intrigues me. Um, and of course, teaching that transforms. So you may you may move around. We can make our circle bigger. And there's things to pick up in water as you get thirsty. Would you mm -hmm. like a cup of water beside you? I think I'm okay, but thank you. Okay. Mm -hmm. And I'll get a cup of water and then I'll sit down here. Um, so I don't know where you want to begin. You teach history, so first of all, you have a love of that. I do, but would you mind if we began? Well, there's a small enough group mm -hmm. here that I think we, to introduce. We introduce, And yeah. maybe say what congregation you're from or what that would. And some other interests you may that have is what too. would draw you here. Is that all right? That's fine. Carolyn can yeah. begin. Carolyn can begin. And we just jump. Tell us say, what you, say what you did here. <laughs> That's her second Perfect. career. Part of Zion. Yeah. Long since birth. Mm -hmm. Gloria Nussbaum, Portland Mennonite, and I already just bent his ear about what I do as a personal historian. So. <laughs> what does it say? Does every, I, mean, I think everybody knows know? that I'm a personal historian. I have people record life stories. Mm -hmm. I've been doing it for 17 years now. So. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I guess me, I'm Jerry Barkman. Uh, it's hard to it's hard to know where to start, but I came to Oregon 30 years ago. Marge and I did, and not long after, Margaret, how long after when I came what, did I become president of these of this group? I don't recall. <laughs> <laughs> Two different times, yeah. periods. I was right. I was about 10 years. I was president of this of the historical society. Uh, the Barkmans come from the Russian experience, the Mennonite Russian experience. And so I have spent considerable time studying that part of Mennonite history mm -hmm. and have written uh, a geneolo genealogical history of my grandfather and my other family members have written book, uh, genealogical books on the Barkmans. They're both in the library here. And uh, I just really enjoy Mennonite history, and uh, so I'm, I'm treasurer of the board of directors now. Live at Hope Village in Canby. Mm -hmm. And one of the people who helped bring about this. Yeah, I guess yes. I was. Yes. <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah. um, uh, John Gertson, and uh, and just as way of introduction, these are my parents, uh, Gordon and Emily. I might as well do it all in a group. Um, and uh, um, with, with last name Gertson, 
Well, part of the the uh, the, the Russian Mennonite um, background. I'm coming from uh, Chapter, Oregon, or Chapter, uh, California. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the uh, one of them, California uh, Russian Mennonite hubs. Mm -hmm. And uh, um, uh, I've always been been uh, 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 fascinated by old things, but also the, the the reasons why people use those old things and how. Some th some things that are old are 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 uh, new again, and so uh, um, I've always enjoyed reading of history, and church history is certainly one of those one of those passions, and uh, um, and and Dad's background is 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 uh, Russian Mennonite. Um, since then, we, we've sought on fellowship in a. In a, in a in more more conservative um, plain uh, um, church, and that that didn't did, didn't always go so well, and uh, so it's it's kind of a long story, but it's as as folks my age like to say, it's complicated. <laughs> <laughs> and I I really enjoyed re reading in some of your books, um, especially um, teaching that transforms with the importance of an of a uh, incarnational aspect mm -hmm. to uh, education and thus discipleship. Mm -hmm. I found those links very good. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And you're worshiping with conservative Mennonite church or um, Holman or not. it's uh, Yeah, it's just kind of... Uh, it's an independent yeah, kind conservative of, church. Yeah, kind of in a... Uh, um, kind of on the fringes, okay. kind of not knowing um, where we're going. Uh -huh. so it's like a Pilgrim Marpeck, um, a, uh, um, I'm forgetting the quote, but uh, but a kind of a, a wandering, uh, wandering disciple, uh -huh. you know, looking for a home. Yeah, I forget the I forget the quote. Well, I'm glad you found your way here this afternoon. Okay. And Thank he's you. a member of the board here. Uh huh. Well. Mm -hmm. Very good. It's tough being compared to Pullman Martak. <laughs> I don't know. It's a high school. As he said, his folks, Gordon and Emily. Mm -hmm. And um, it's good to be here. Yeah. And I just want to say this as far as John. Uh, yeah, when he says he's read your books, he's probably read most of them. Um, he has... Um, he has a, a lot... He won't say this, but I will. Uh, he has a library... He has an Anabaptist library that would rival most uh, institutions. Uh -huh. Good. A passion for literature. Make sure, make sure we get him. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> He's next. Uh, Ken and Barbara Roop were members at Portland Mennonite. Uh, I grew up early grade school years in this area, a mile down the road. Uh, so we have some roots here, but we've lived in Portland for 30 plus years. Um, my family roots come from the mid Midwest, from Kansas, and Barb comes from uh, Reedley, California. We both had Mennonite families, you know, been in a Mennonite family all of our lives. Uh, our kids, not so much. They've sort of opted to go different direction. One lives in Florida and one lives in Gresham. Mm -hmm. but I've always had an interest in in history and uh, and in Mennonite history as well. Not that I'm up to speed on all of it, but have an interest sure. in that. I don't know if you want to share or something. Just interested in where I came from. You know, mm -hmm. like to hear stories mm -hmm. and read about it and so on. Follow. Family has written a little bit about where they came from. Uh, grandfather came through Russia, was born there. But I just find it very interesting mm -hmm. to share with others. Sheldon and Janice Rick Holger. I'll let Janice introduce herself. <clears throat> we were born real close to each other. Mm -hmm. in well, Wayne I was born in Puerto Rico. Oh, you, you were? Know. Okay, that's right. You had spent <laughs> time there. <laughs> but grew up. I That's an island, isn't it? 
uh, near Holmes County, Ohio. Mm -hmm. So Wayne County was my county, mm -hmm. and my mother's county was um, Tuscarawas, Newcomer's Town. Mm -hmm. So that's the long roots there. My mother had roots there. Um, we moved here to this area, became members of the Hot Zion 15, 18 years ago? 18 years ago. <clears throat> and uh, have been in Seattle now for the last five years. Seattle, Washington. Where our two children are. And grandchildren. And five grandchildren. And five grandchildren. <laughs> <laughs> I can't think of a better reason. And Sheldon, Sheldon's books are in our library. Uh -huh. Thank you, Sheldon. My library. Well, my library, yeah. not my books. <laughs> when we moved. Yeah. From, yeah he, the books. Yeah. Stayed. Sheldon had an extensive library. Yes. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And I'm Janice. Um, my maiden name is Sprunger, so I have Swiss Mennonite uh, roots. And um, really, I'm glad to be back here and enjoyed our time at Zion, um, especially quilting with Margaret, <laughs> um, and she helped me learn a lot about, a lot about the history of the area here, mm -hmm. sitting around the quilt together. Mm -hmm. I'm Rosie Shetler, and I'm here because I brought my mother-in-law. <laughs> right. But your growing up roots, Rosie, were? Well, my, since I was married, I went to, went to Zion for uh -huh. a while. We're not now, but we did. For but you grew up in Idaho. I grew up in Idaho. I grew up in Idaho. Uh -huh. I'm in my church, yes. Mm -hmm. I didn't know. Mm -hmm. so. I'm <clears throat> Margaret Shetler. I was not raised Mennonite. I was not raised in a Christian home, actually. Uh, I had no living, no grandfathers that I knew. I mean, they both died very young. I don't know where, where, where do I go. Oh, and we moved to this, this area here. In 1935, I think, during the depths of the Depression. Mm. And I, my introduction to the Mennonite Church was through summer Bible school. Uh -huh. And I, I enjoyed it. I, 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 I remember Zion, here at Zion, have been for, I guess, 1966, we put our membership mm. in here. Yeah. Went to Hesed, where I met Ralph. Mm. He's been gone now. It'll be 14 years in just a couple of weeks. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. mm -hmm. And as far as the historical society, I think I was involved in the first first meeting, mm -hmm. and been part of it. I'm still a part of it, but I don't do anything anymore. I have I've lost the sight of the sight completely. And this was half gone. <laughs> So I don't do much of anything anymore. But I was archivist, did the archival work here for years and years. Margaret, it's a real honor to meet you. Well, thank you. I have spent, uh, oh, over the last uh, two or three weeks, I have worked my way through your centennial history oh. of Zion. <laughs> of Zion. And uh, okay. really appreciate the amount of energy oh, and that's... attention to detail the immersion well, I, in the sources that you know, I I worked as a, as an editorial secretary at the Primate Center and for writing, uh, working with you know scientific. I said I avoided all. I, history was my favorite subject in high school. I avoided all the science classes <laughs> that I could, <laughs> and, 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 and ended up working on <laughs> research. Uh -huh. So, I don't do much of it. I'm living in a retirement Yeah. Mount mm -hmm. Angel Towers and don't do much of anything anymore because <laughs> well. I can't see well enough. Well, it's mm -hmm. nice to meet you. Me too. Mm -hmm. But we do check your memory from time to time, mm -hmm. asking you things and yes, things let come, you come up and have yeah. 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 And Just you an can. anecdote. My dad and Ralph, her husband, were at Heston together. Same time, they were pitcher and catcher on the baseball court. <laughs> well, they went to grade school together. Too. Even grade school. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, and my dad and Ralph were in CPS together. Well, yes, yes. Uh, 
Mm -hmm. Toward yeah. the end, you would yeah. Yeah. on the dairy Where farm. Folks on the dairy farm. Uh, Ralph and Margaret quite well. <laughs> yeah, on the dairy farm, the infamous dairy. Right. <laughs> <laughs> well, the dairy, on the dairy farm, you were on the end. We were fortunate. Yeah, yeah my dad was, was on the oh, infamous dairy farm. <laughs> 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 yeah. Yes, I, our, our house kind of became a refuge <laughs> yeah. it, for more than one. Mm -hmm. It wasn't your, just your dad. Right? Mm -hmm. yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. Every place needs people like that. Mm -hmm. I'm Pat Hirschberger, and I grew up Mennonite, and uh, I would have roots that go Amish and Mennonite church, and my maternal grandfather, I believe, was a convert into what would be called the Dunkard Church, which I'm never quite sure is that Church of the Brethren or Brethren in Christ now. That one isn't clear to me. And uh, so that was um, some of the influences upon me growing up. And then I learned some years, John Ruth was telling the story, and because Tyson or Tyson is also part of my ancestry, my maternal ancestry, John Ruth is telling the story that on this first boat of Mennonites that William Penn has brought to Pennsylvania, there was a young man, single yet, Cornelius Tyson, and we had had a reunion notice earlier that summer saying we were honoring this man's whatever, how many hundreds of years it had been he'd come to the country. So I said, oh, is that like Daughters of the Revolution kind of society? <laughs> so the stories of our faith do interest me. Um, and I want, I want people to know, I want our children to know, mm -hmm. and to appreciate that. Mm -hmm. yeah. Wonderful. Mm -hmm. And then the photographer. Mm. <laughs> My name is John Gingrich. Um, I was born and raised here in the community, a family of nine children, and uh, went to 91 school. My mother went there. All my kids went there. Now my grandkids are there. So we're, we're deeply rooted here in the community. Um, history was never a, a priority for me. It was learning dates and facts and very seldom, if ever, got into what's going on, what's making these things happen. And uh, when my children went to Goshen College, I, one thing I heard from all three of them was the history teacher they had. <laughs> heard about you. And even though they had different experiences totally at Goshen, mm -hmm. that's one thing they agreed on. I started reading your books and uh, paying attention to the things you write, and really appreciate them. Mm -hmm. And I've been, uh, when they moved f from Western over here, the Historical Society, uh, I volunteered to help with the technical aspects of it, and uh, worked with Margaret to get all the hard work she'd done online, so people can find out what's here and where it's at, and that type of thing. Mm -hmm. And you are an avid reader. You, you read mm -hmm. a lot. I like mm -hmm. to read. Uh -huh. And share. Share your insights. I read a lot of the books that come here. I can't read all of them, but uh, <laughs> especially the ones that, that authors donate, I make it a point to read all those books uh -huh. and uh, That's wonderful. enjoy them. Yeah. Well, I really appreciate you know, people taking some time to, to share. It's, um, I know some of you, but not all of you, and it's, it's nice to have just a little deeper picture of, of what your interests are and where you, where you come from. Um, I thought maybe I would share just a little bit of the trajectory of my story and um, I'm still kicking myself. I have brought some recent materials that are part of the work that I'm really interested in right now related to the global church. And I put them in the suitcase, and I left the suitcase uh, at uh, the uh, Chup, Hawkman Chups, uh, my host. Uh, and I always carry everything here. But Could uh, Louise go and get those for you? Well, I don't know if it's worth it at this point. But um, <laughs> Well, Kevin and Cynthia are working over in the barn this afternoon, too. Yeah, I'll, I'll bring them. If any of you are able to come to church tomorrow, I'll bring them along to church. Oh, you mean we don't have to? 
Uh, pardon? <laughs> we don't have to go to church tomorrow? <laughs> <laughs> well, I will bring them so you can come to church tomorrow. You will be able to find these materials. But that's, that's fine. Um, I, uh, I am... Well, welcome. Hi. Come on in. And actually, we just finished introductions. So why don't the, the people, and those of you who just joined, and not to put you on the spot, Louise Gingrich. But we we re really are just starting, so you're you're right on time. Um, and from this congregation. Yes. Okay. Uh -huh. I'm to that. Oh, okay. <laughs> so that's the connection. It's the first Uh huh. And I'm from this congregation. Very good. And interested in history. Ur Ursula has a story you might want to hear a short version of. You want to tell how you got here, Ursula? The rest of us told how we got here. Well, <laughs> the Zion Mennonite Church sponsored my family in, the 80, in 1983. From Poland? From Poland. Mm -hmm. when was I read about you in the book. Oh. <laughs> oh! You're in the book! I'm in the book. I didn't know that. So. Yeah, and I didn't know much about Mennonites. <laughs> and we were at the camp, refugee camp in Germany, and somebody said, we went to embassy, they tell us who gonna, who gonna sponsor us, it says Zion Mennonite Church. And I came and to the camp back, and he says, where are you going? And well, we're going to Oregon, Zion Mennonite Church. Oh, Mennonites are cold. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, uh oh. <laughs> and I says to my husband, if I don't like it, I'm going to run away from it. <laughs> Guess what? It's 35 years and I'm still here. <laughs> Wonderful. Wonderful. So, that cold is not that bad. <laughs> Well, it is. All of us are immigrants in one way or another. Yes. I mean, we all have a story of of how we got here. And uh, my grandfather actually was the immigrant from Alsace Lorraine. He he came in 1897 as an 11 year old, uh, and um, he, the Roths. My my father is Paul E. Roth, but a different Paul E. Roth than yes. that was part of this congregation. I was. Uh, the Roths jumped out at me uh, here, and I actually went back and traced their connections on the other side of the ocean. So Christian and Joseph, who were the Roth immigrants in 1852 who came to Zion, I don't know if this matters to any of you, but uh, those Roths actually are distant relatives, but the connection is on the other side of the ocean. Uh, 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 Illinois, uh, Periodical, just I got a copy the other day, and it talks about your fam family. Okay. Family. Okay. Well, they. Um, I I grew up. Um, my my father thought he was going to be a hog farmer. He hurt his back when he was 22 and said he was no good for farming. So what was he going to do? And at that point, he lived in West Liberty, Ohio, and the pastor there. Uh, Stanley Shank was the pastor at that point, said, well, why don't you go to school? Why don't you go to college? So he went to Goshen College, and there he got interested in science and medicine. So he uh, went to medical school and then wanted to do, uh, well, what needed to do alternative service, and um, that's what took them to Puerto Rico, which is where I was born. So I was born in Puerto Rico, uh, and, but was two years old when they moved back to the United States. And at that point, they had a strong interest in home mission, and they wanted to be close to a Mennonite community, but not in a Mennonite community. Um, and so they settled in uh, the western part of Holmes County. Now, I don't know if Holmes County, Ohio rings a bell, but it's a large Amish and Mennonite settlement in Ohio. And uh, there's almost an invisible line that you can draw between Walnut Creek and Millersburg in which Amish and Mennonites live on one side, and then it was, well, mostly recent migrants from Kentucky and Southern Ohio, um, sort of Appalachian Hill folks who moved on the uh, western uh, part of Holmes County, and that's where I grew up. So I went to school without any Mennonites, 
uh, and always had an awareness that, of a strong sense of identity, but also um, a, a little bit of a sense of looking in from the outside. Uh, I came to Goshen College, thought I was going to go on in science, and in fact took also, I have a, a, a major in natural science, but somewhere along the line, actually there's a very specific story, I won't tell it right now, but I dropped out of school, I went to Europe uh, as a sort of a wandering soul, um, as an 18 year old, and spent some really formative time there, um, and came back a changed person, and um, was hungry to know more about history. I, I lived with a peasant family in Lower Austria, right at the Czechos what was then Czechoslovakia, right at the Czechoslovakian border. And every day they talked about World War II. World War II was a living memory for them mm -hmm. in a way that it wasn't for me. And they would ask me what I thought about Yalta. Mm -hmm. And I, I was so embarrassed. I knew nothing about <laughs> this history. And I came, I didn't even know what I didn't know, you know how that is. And I came back hungry to learn uh, more. And so I ended up also taking history classes and I discovered at the end of my time at Goshen that it was history that really interested me more than, than, than science. And so I went on in history and um, was focused on German social history of the 18th century. So that's what I was uh, going to do. And, uh, graduated, got my, finished that work, and actually had a job offer at the University of Oregon. So I came out to Eugene with my wife, and we did the interview, and we had a really tough decision. I was ready to come here, but in her wisdom, uh, <laughs> uh, Ruth said she, she, she wanted to raise a family where there were other people. Uh, I mean, she wanted, in a, in a, in a, it's not that there wouldn't have been, um, there was a Mennonite church in Eugene, but it was, it was pretty small, and she just had a sense that Goshen was a, so I, I ended up going to Goshen. At first it seemed like, um, I don't know, uh, a, a second choice, but very soon it became clear to me that this was a place that I wanted to be, and the decision to go to Goshen was connected with the uh, invitation or the opportunity to be part of a longer tradition of, I would say, scholarship for the church that had been part of Goshen College's identity probably since the 1920s or 30s. So you think about I don't know if these names mean anything, but Harold Bender and Guy of Hirschberger and J.C. Wenger, and then my mentor, John Oyer, um, and they had built up a library there, the Mennonite Historical Library, and there was also a publication called the Mennonite Quarterly Review, and part of the job at Goshen was to take up the work of overseeing the library and this journal. And um, that was also a challenge because I was not all that interested in Anabaptist Mennonite history. That wasn't really what, what my training was. And you know, that's part of the downside of graduate school. You get so focused on such a small, small area and you think that that's the whole world. And, uh, and yet, uh, there was this, what I now see as a remarkable opportunity. So I kind of retooled, retrained in 16th century Anabaptist history and have spent really my whole career now at 33 years at Goshen and have almost all of the, the work that I have done has been at somebody else's invitation or suggestion. So um, this first book, Choosing Against War, was a request right after 9-11 um, when it was really difficult to explain why would Mennonites continue to be pacifists in the midst of this horrific event that seemed to call forth righteous anger. Um, uh, and then uh, the Herald Press, uh, well, well, yeah. So in many ways I have seen 
what I've tried to do as continuing scholarship for the church. And that also means being open to responding to, to requests and trying to write for an, a literate, informed readership, but not specialists, people who, who are or lay people. Um, <laughs> And, and that has also been a joy, I would say, trying to find, find a voice that can connect uh, at, at both of those levels. For maybe uh, 20 years of those 33 years, maybe 25, that's sort of what I pictured myself doing. And then, um, quite unexpectedly, uh, I was invited in the year 2000 by the Mennonite Church USA to participate in a conversation with the Lutherans. Um, the, uh, I don't want to spend too much time going into this, but it, it, the Lutheran Church, maybe 68 million people around the world, 70 million, have at the core of their church identity, a confession of faith. It's called the Augsburg Confession. It goes back to 1530. And this Augsburg Confession, which was the summation of their theological, the distillation of their theological insight at the, soon after their beginnings, um, continues to be authoritative for Lutherans. It's the glue that holds the Lutheran church together. Sola Scriptura, yeah, but Scripture, it's read through the lens of this confession. And it turns out that in this confession, uh, at, I think, well, seven different places, but five for sure, there are condemnations of the Anabaptists. Mm -hmm. And uh, this goes back to, in 1980, they were celebrating, the Lutherans in Germany were celebrating the commemoration of this, I think it was 450 years of the Augsburg Confession, and in good ecumenical fashion, they invited many different groups to join them in Augsburg to celebrate this document. And they invited Mennonites. And the Mennonites said, thank you, we'll go. We are pleased to be part of this invitation. But you should know that we are you are asking us to, to be part of a celebration of a document that actually condemns us. And when you read the language, it's, it's, it's both a spiritual condemnation, we condemn you to hell, mm -hmm. and it also is a civil condemnation. You are traitors, seditious people who deserve to be imprisoned and, well, executed, ultimately. So this is, it's not casual language, but of course, for 450, or at least 400 years, Lutherans read, first of all, not many Lutherans, actually have committed the Augsburg Confession to memory. And those who have, when they read, we condemn the Anabaptists who teach that, are not thinking of contemporary Mennonites. So this had sort of been gone on in their history. And, um, and to their credit, they took that very seriously. Mm -hmm. And they initiated some conversations, first with Mennonites in Germany and then France. And then in the 1990s, here in Oregon, Washington, Oregon, the Lutheran uh, Synod uh, said, we need to deal with this. And they asked the ELCA, the Evangelical Lutheran Church in America, if they would take this on as a conversation with Mennonite Church, which then became Mennonite Church USA. And as part of that, I was invited as a historian to be in these conversations. And I had never never really given much thought to all of this. I mean, this was part of the history. I was very comfortable telling a standard story of Anabaptists in the 16th century as heroic followers of Jesus who earnestly tried to live out what Jesus taught and were persecuted by both Catholics and Lutherans and also the Reformed Church. Mm -hmm. and held firm to their faith, and that this was central to my, our identity. So telling the stories of the martyrs was crucial to how I told that, that story. And even though I never framed it quite this way, there was also a little bit of a sense that, yes, all Christians claim to follow Jesus, all Christians read the Sermon on the Mount, 
but we're the ones who actually do it. And, um, and after all, your people killed my people. I mean, there is a kind of, just, it's a, 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 a even though I hadn't experienced persecution, I mean, this, um, there was something comfortable about being in that position of slight moral superiority. Um, and so we were asked, I, I was asked to be a historian in these conversations around the Augsburg Confession. And initially, we both had very simple solutions to this question um, of the condemnations. Our argument was, well, we've had many confessions of faith, and if you don't like the Augsburg Confession, just change it. I mean, just change the language. And for them, yeah. this was unthinkable, yeah. um, because the Augsburg Confession, it's, you know, it's like if you don't like something in the Gospel of John, you don't just change the Gospel. <laughs> I mean, you, you don't change a historical text. And what's more, I'm going into too much detail, I can tell already, but uh, in the 1580s, there had been Lutherans who were, uh, who were arguing about certain language in the Augsburg Confession, and they quickly realized this is just going to lead to endless mm -hmm. wrangling, and so it became the unaltered Augsburg Confession. So if you read the, today, it will, see, it will be, see the unaltered Augsburg Confession, which is what holds 70 million Lutherans together. So that was a non-starter for them. They wouldn't even put footnotes in this text. Um, and for us, they said, well, these are condemnations of Anabaptists, and you're not Anabaptists, you're Mennonites. So, um, so we can just say, <laughs> we didn't condemn you. And we said, well, no, we actually claim that heritage, and we still believe some of the things that they are condemned for believing. That is part of our tradition. Yeah, Derek. Uh, <coughs> Dr. David Rempel. Um, is a Russian Mennonite historian. He's, he's passed on since. He was a thorn in the flesh of the Mennonite historian in that he said, in several places, he said, you folks are not telling the whole story. Mm -hmm. In other words, uh, you're not telling stories about Grandfather Roth because he was part of the problem. Mm -hmm. and, mm -hmm. and it really got to be in, in some circle of a real discussion. How much of that kind of attitude did you see among you as Mennonite historians and theologians and the Lutherans? In other mm -hmm. words, you know, do you get what I'm trying to I, I do. I do. Uh, because because the, you're not telling the whole story. If you told the whole story of Martin Luther, you'd probably be aghast mm -hmm. at what he said and what he did. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So... Well, this became, then, it became clear that our easy solutions for how we were going to solve this in the Augsburg Confession were not going to work, and it forced us to step back mm -hmm. and ask deeper questions. And it also became clear that we were not, you know, Mennonites don't usually think about their, their faith primarily in confessional language. We are a story-shaped people. We're shaped by our, our history. We, when we want to talk about who, what we believe, we often tell, tell stories. And in that sense, our telling of the story was central to our identity. And the Lutherans recognized that they had a kind of amnesia about their story. They had focused on this text and the stability of this text that almost escaped history. You know, it's just it's language about theology that you just carry forward. And they never really asked many questions about the historical context out of which it emerged. And it forced us to ask harder questions about memory and about, especially, well, for both of us. And so we decided that rather than having most of the conversation be discussions about what we believe about baptism or what we believe about the state, we needed to first tend to the history. 
And to compress a, the story a bit, the conversations between MCUSA and ELCA shifted then to a global conversation between the Lutheran World Federation and Mennonite World Conference. And I was asked to continue that conversation <laughs> on behalf of Mennonite World Conference. And at that point, we agreed that we would try to write a shared history of our beginnings and Anabaptist or Mennonite and Lutheran beginnings. Could we write a history that both of us would recognize? Hmm. And it was the hardest historical work I have ever done. <laughs> I was paired with a very bright, very orthodox, very gifted um, Lutheran historian. His name is Timothy Wengert from Gettysburg Theological Seminary. And we worked very, very hard at seeing if we could tell a narrative of the 16th century that we both could recognize. And we, were, we talked about it in terms of right remembering. Sometimes the impulse is to say if there's pain in the past, you should just not talk about it, forget it, you know, move on. Uh, or there is a temptation to simplify. <laughs> I, mean, I like my narrative of the Anabaptist as heroes, as the clarity of the Christian witness. And I had not given very much thought to how it was perceived from the Lutheran side. And it forced me to slow down and to put this in a, in a more complicated context. And it's not that at the end we agreed theologically. In fact, we still have significant difference on baptism and the state. But the work that we put into that created, um, I think it was a 150-page history that then the Lutheran World Federation picked up and went through some pretty careful scrutiny by its own guardians of truth. And in 2010, at their global assembly, the Lutheran World Federation invited mm -hmm. Mennonite World Conference representatives to come for a service of reconciliation in which they formally and publicly uh, apologized for the actions of their antecedents. And instead of voting on this document, the moderator of that gathering, there may be 1,200 people in this massive room, asked them to vote by kneeling. And um, that's what they did. And it, it, I've had various conversion experiences in my life. <laughs> and we usually sometimes think, you know, there's only one. <laughs> but there, there's more than one. <laughs> that is moments where you realize, oh, I have to think about things differently now because of this. And that public commitment to reconciliation meant that as a historian, I also am committed to telling the story of the Anabaptist narrative differently. And the story that I tell students has to include 2010 and the service of reconciliation. And it has to be told more complicated in the 16th century the sort of virtuous Anabaptists against the so-called Christian Lutherans is, I have to imagine Tim Wingert sitting in my class when I teach. And how, what, what would that sound like to him? And it has made it more complicated, but it has also, um, I think, been a profound gift. I don't know how how something like that trickles down. I doubt if my home congregation, your local congregations don't necessarily sit up and take note that, okay, something is different because of this. Mm -hmm. 
And yet I firmly believe that a generation from now, as this story becomes more embedded in our awareness, we will have to tell our history differently. Uh, at least I hope, I hope we will. That um, experience led to another conversion. When I had been aware of Mennonite World Conference, at least vaguely, but not actively involved, but when I served on this commission with the Lutherans, I became more aware of what Mennonite World Conference was about, and perhaps more importantly, as a historian, I became aware in a new way that the 500-year-old tradition that I had focused on mostly in the 16th century, I mean, that, was the, that was the story for me, that this tradition that I claimed, that had claimed me, was in the midst of a profound transformation that I had not paid much attention to. 30 years ago, 35 years ago, there were about 800,000 Mennonites in the world, 700,000. Today, in, in my lifetime, in our lifetime, today there are 2.2 million. So in the last 35 years, we've gone from about 700,000 to 2.2 million, I mean more than tripled, in this 500-year-old tradition that now is exploding. And I, I realized that I knew almost nothing about what was going on with that transformation of this tradition, largely because it was happening outside of places like Newton and Goshen and Fresno and Harrisonburg and Winnipeg and Kitchener um, or, or places in Europe that are the no, we know we know what this tradition is. It starts in Europe and then it moves to North America, and that's us. This is what the tradition is. And I begin to realize that I need to know more about what is happening in the almost 80 countries around the world which claim the majority of Mennonites. Do you realize that? MBs and the GCMC Unified Church in Canada and the United States, we are now 6% of the Anabaptist Mennonite family around the world. That's not how I, f I feel, no. I, no, we are at the center and everyone else is at the periphery. The truth is, no, we have, and, and I, I don't say that to shame us or anything. I mean, it's just that there is something really profound happening. Uh, already at, uh, in 2002, the Mazarete Christus Church in Ethiopia became the largest national body. Today there are almost 400,000 uh, baptized members of the Mennonite Church means Christ the Foundation, a name that they took straight from Menno Simons, uh, the no other foundation can anyone lay, the, I mean Menno Simons theme verse, uh, is by far the largest national body. Churches in the Congo not far behind, and other churches, Indonesia, India. So, in the last 20 years, more than 92% of new Anabaptists have come from outside of Europe and North America. That means that something profound is happening. And I became con convicted, I guess. And it's a tough, it's a tough, I, I don't quite know how to, how, to, how to describe this. One of the gifts of the Anabaptist Mennonite tradition is that when we say church, we're going to church, we think of the local congregation. I mean, that's our... That is where, we don't just go to church to worship on Sunday morning, it's where that web of relationships of 
sharing each other's burdens, of sharing each other's tools, of sharing each other's labor, of mutual aid. That, 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 that thick web of relationships is when we think of church, it is not primarily, you know, if you're a Catholic, you might think of church as you go there for the sacrament or something. You go there to, to take the Mass. No, church is embedded relationships, and that's such a gift. But it also means that we have an Im impoverished theological vocabulary for the church beyond the local congregation. We really struggle to know how are we connected to each other Outside, well, sometimes we struggle. How <laughs> are we connected to each other within the congregation? But when we talk about conferences, uh, how are congregations connected to each other in conferences? And when we talk about the denomination, or I think some of us would say, well, of course, our Methodist and Presbyterian, Episcopalian neighbors, of course, they're Christians. But we don't think very hard about in what sense are we connected. And then when it comes to the global Anabaptist church, I think we're just sort of bewildered. What is it that connects me with a church in the Congo? Because I don't have relationships with them. And so I think sometimes we, we, we give up on that thought of what it is that connects us. And yet, the church of Jesus Christ from the day of Pentecost has always been an international church. And our growth has happened in part through mission, and that's one important point of connection. I think that's why we're most comfortable when we talk about mission. But this tremendous growth that has happened in the last 30 years, in each case, happened when, at a certain point, the missionaries from wherever, from the... Mennonite Board of Missions and Charity, or Virginia Mennonite Conference, or Eastern Mennonite Missions, or all of the sending agencies, at a certain point, people who had been recipients of the good news of the gospel said something like, thank you very much, we'll take it from here. And at that point, when people talk about the indigenization of the gospel, at that point, when it's local leaders who are writing songs in their idioms, who are using their metaphors for preaching, who are worshiping in the styles that they feel most comfortable, who are giving cultural expression in the ways that make sense in their context, that's when we see this explosive growth. And it means that being Mennonite, being Anabaptist, being part of this tradition, continues to find expression in cultural forms that look very different from you or me. And, we, and that that's a good thing. <laughs> that's a good thing. Even though it's difficult. I mean, and we read in the New Testament, right from the beginning, mm -hmm. there are these debates over how, but how is the gospel going to be enculturated? Mm -hmm. And how do we relate to each other when you enculturate it in a very different way than I do? And I just had not given. I don't think so much of my faith is being enculturated. I don't, I don't, we have, you can see it in theological bookcases. So you have theology, and then you have contextual theology, which is what people in Asia or Japan, or, or Indonesia, or they're doing contextual theology. They're taking our theology and then trying to figure out what it means. That's a really, to my way of thinking, a kind of problematic way of looking at it. It's not like we, it, it, it suggests that we never contextualize, that we have, we have the pure stream, and they're the ones who are trying to import it into their setting without asking harder in what way are we contextualizing the gospel. And that's, we have to. I mean, it's a good thing. It's not a problem to have cultural expressions, but you should be aware of it. You should be alert to it. And it may be too much to hope for, but I have come to believe that the renewal of our struggling little church in, in North America, the renewal of MCUSA or all of the other expressions of the church in North America 
The, our renewal is going to happen in no small part to the degree that we are able to be more attentive to what the Spirit is doing in settings outside of our context and receptive, inquisitive about what's happening, hungry to learn more, rather than seeing it as an exotically interesting thing that we might, you know, visit every now and then. I mean, we need a visit. <laughs> but what would it mean to actually yearn to know more about what it means to be an Anabaptist Christian in Ethiopia? Um, six years ago, I started, it has a name that is bigger than the reality. It's called the Institute for the Study of Global Anabaptism. Um, ISGA. The Institute for the Study of Global Anabaptism it really is just one more little pile of papers in my cinder block <laughs> office. But, <laughs> but it seemed to me important to say that in the last third of my career, I want to bring scholarship for the church to the global church. And, and put all of the, whatever experience or understandings or questions or resources that I can gather to the service of knowing more about what's happening and of bringing some of those, that energy, that dynamism, that excitement that people are finding in the Anabaptist tradition in those settings back to us. We have five projects going. I don't have my literature with me, but that's okay. Here is one of them. I'll just give this as one example. The stories of the Martyr's Mirror have always been important to me. And even if, um, you know, there's a, a sense in which the Martyr's Mirror is more frequently purchased than read. Uh, <laughs> we, we don't, it shows up in a lot of my books, I don't, or in many of my poems. I don't know how many, and yet it's a, it's a, it's a kind of icon. It's a, it's a testimony in itself, just that big, big book. That book came about because people thought it important to gather stories. And so the very first edition of The Martyr's Mirror, which we know as a big, a big book, started out as a very tiny book. Uh, actually, it started out as hymns that were collected and then put together. And then in around 1562, uh, the Dutch collected it. Uh, we have some copies in the historical library. It's called Het Offer des Herren, the Sacrifice unto the Lord. And it's tiny, it's small, because it had, was a secret book. It was published at the time when people were still being killed. And that went through about nine editions. Um, and each edition got a little bigger, because there were more stories to add. And then um, and it becomes in 1611, 1613, a little bit bigger. And then we come to the Martyr's Mirror by the end of the 17th century. And then it has, we now we're at a coffee-sized table book, and one of the leading artists of the Dutch cultural renaissance, Jan Lauken, contributes 104, I mean, that's what we remember. We remember the pictures, the images, that are exquisitely rendered. And so this is an illustrated, expensive coffee table book that by now wealthy Mennonites, Dutch Mennonites, are buying. And it serves an important function, but there it is, and we have translated that 17th century book into German and English. It continues to show up, and some of the stories are popularized, but the canon was closed. We quit adding to it after this dynamic publication history. And it's not as if persecution or suffering suddenly came to an end. It's just that people, Thielman von Brock was the pastor who collected all these stories and that became the official version. And that always bothered me as a historian. Why aren't we telling, why aren't we gathering stories in that same way for the next volume of The Martyr's Mirror? And when I became interested in the global church, it quickly became apparent to me that one element of this energy in some settings, not every setting, but in many settings, is the experience of suffering. That new Anabaptist Christians 
find the Anabaptist story compelling in part because it reflects what they are experiencing. And it just seemed to me that we need to be more active in gathering stories of faithfulness to Christ in the face of suffering. That, that those stories need to be pulled together and, and, and honored. Um, I'm sure many of you have heard what has been happening in Nigeria, the EYN Church in Nigeria. Um, in northwestern Nigeria, northeastern Nigeria, uh, has been hit, uh, has, has suffered enormously uh, from Boko Haram, which is an aggressive, um, I'd say a splinter group uh, uh, that, of, of, of Islamic splinter group that has a whole complicated story in itself. But two years ago, two and a half years ago in April, when those 273 schoolgirls mm -hmm. were in Chaibok were, were kidnapped, almost all of those were members of this Brethren in Christ church, a peace church. And they would say they're an Anabaptist church. And in the years since then, more than 10,000 of their members have been killed, which is three times as many people as show up in the Martyr's Mayor. Mm -hmm. And when I hear that, I think, well, wow, you hear these numbers, you don't quite know what to do with it, but every one of those was a son, a, a, a daughter, a father, a mother, a sister, a brother. I mean, you use aggregate numbers, but they, these are people, individuals. And those stories need, need to be tended to. Somebody needs to gather them. And so in a kind of, um, I, I always tell people that ISGA projects I do on a 50-year horizon. So there's no quick, uh, I'm, this is, you know, we, we jump in and we, and because nobody owns the Martyr's Mirror, I thought we can't do this, uh, this project just with Mennonites. And so we pulled together Old Order Amish, Beachy Amish, um, Hutterite, Bruderhof, uh, conservative Mennonites, uh, at least representatives. And we have set us about the task of trying to be attentive and to slowly gather as many stories as we can. It's called the Bearing Witness Stories Project. So martyr, means witness in the Greek. To be a martyr is to bear witness. Mm -hmm. So the Bearing Witness Stories Project is a slow effort to be to pull these stories together and, and maybe there will be a third volume of the Martyr's Mirror that would come out of this. Right now we are doing it mostly online. And this was uh, a project that the Bruderhof people um, it's part of the of the Hutterite uh, church uh, tradition. Um, uh, they helped helped us pull this first collection together. Um, it's hard because it means you have to define who is a martyr and what stories do you how, how do you tell their stories? Telling stories is complicated, um, and. We discovered just in, in producing this book that we could, didn't always agree on, on what the qualifications were. And so, you know, I don't have illusions that this is going to be uh, easy or quick, but it seems like an important project. And it's part of, it's one of, of five initiatives that we are taking in collaboration with others that I hope in 50 years will pay off. Uh, it pay off, that it will have some, leave some, some mark in how we tell our story. I've gone on probably too long already, um, but I am um, really grateful to have landed in this unusual position. I see it as a vocation, as a calling. Um, it's a challenge. The world is changing 
um, sometimes it feels like um, the resources and the interest and the energy around what I'm about is diminishing rather than growing. Mm -hmm. I'm working, you know, in a setting where church institutions are not at the center of a lot of people's lives and attention, and I get that. I mean, things change. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so it feels daunting, but I also feel, I wake up every morning and feel like, this is good work. It's what I want to do. So let me stop there and give you a chance to, <coughs> to respond or to ask questions. I didn't ask about time. Maybe I've already gone on too long. Sorry if that's the We're case. We're in time. Let's, let's keep ourselves to 90 minutes to okay. recognize that other things yeah. happening. Yeah. Right. You had a question, yeah. Ellen? So how do I inform myself? Pardon? How do I inform myself? You're in well, if I had been <laughs> better organized, well, you're gonna show us tomorrow. I would have brought... <laughs> Um, I, I would be glad to add you to our mailing list. Oh, that's good. So we have a newsletter that comes out twice a year. Okay, we want that here. Uh huh. <laughs> I would be glad. Let's make sure that um, we do that. So I'll leave a, a, a piece of paper, and anyone who would like to be on the mailing list, I would be glad to add you to that. Um, are there any websites? Or, I mean, there that's are. what I think of how we learn things now, mm -hmm. as we go online and. Mm -hmm. There are indeed. So if you go to bearingwitness.org. Okay. Um, no, sorry. Let me give you the literature. We have we okay. have three different three different websites. Okay. One other project is Gamio Global Anabaptist Mennonite uh -huh. Encyclopedia yeah. Online, mm -hmm. which is the Mennonite Encyclopedia. So uh, I think it's about sixteen thousand articles now that are online. We have access to it online. Sure, everyone yeah. should. Yeah. But we haven't done very well in putting the G in Gamio. It's not very global. And so that's okay. the, what the ISGA is doing. We're looking for 20 articles a year from one place in the global church. So every year, like last year it was Kenya. Mm -hmm. This year it's going to be Costa Rica. Next year, so we, we're just going to focus and try to get 20 articles and then the world's bigger than that, but we, we do <laughs> what we can mm -hmm. to make the G in Gamio have integrity. Um, but I'll give, I'll give you that, that literature. Other questions or comments or concerns or... Mm. So you are still teaching at Goshen College? Yes. I. Um, I am, although my teaching has cut way back, I, I was, I'm more convinced of the importance of the ISGA than Goshen College administrators. And so, <laughs> I, I know, I, A little I, tension. John's <laughs> taking this. Well, it's okay. No, they're in a tough spot. I mean, they need to keep the college afloat. They need students. and. What I'm doing does not necessarily translate into en enrollment growth. Mm -hmm. It fits with the tradition of scholarship for the church, but when finances are tight, so I I now I raise half of my own salary. So I do half of my my work is just with donations, and so I teach two courses. I do one course is for uh, the historical library, and one course is Mennonite Quarterly Review. So we have eight courses as full load, four courses, so I teach two, one course is for MHL and one is MQR. The, the purpose of the question, not to put you in a, <laughs> a tough spot, is how do you convey this mm -hmm. new information, this new excitement mm -hmm. to this next generation, I mm -hmm. guess? And then because you're at Goshen College, right. it seemed like that might be a place where that might happen. I'm just curious what your experience was. Right. Be. And there it's a challenge, too. Now, I don't want to cast it negatively, but I have a unique position in some ways of, of connecting with young people. <laughs> but right now, um, about a third, slightly more than a third of our students come from the region. So they would be Catholic, Lutheran, Episcopalian, nuns uh, from 
from the region. About a third are uh, uh, Latino students, mostly Catholic. And about a third are Mennonites. And so we're already now talking about a pretty small group of Mennonites who are the most likely to be interested. And it turns out in these, uh, you know, parents still remember the economic downturn of 2008 and the pressure to have a, a major that leads directly to a job is pretty strong, which is understandable if you're going to go to college, you, you know, so, um, so it's, it's a challenge to convince young people in general that history matters. I, I would say this is, um, there's an excitement about the global church. It's, it's not hard to be excited about it for me. I'm not trying to sell them something that um, I'm not enthused about, but, but making the connections is not easy. I find it much easier to do it with international students mm -hmm. who come <laughs> already aware that there are many cultures and that this is um, of interest and who are pleased to have someone interested in their, mm -hmm. in their reality. Yeah, I, I wish I was more, I wish I could say that, you know, I teach a class that has 60 students in it and that they are all fully engaged. I can't. I hear in this something of, for the local congregation, we do mm -hmm. think more local anymore. Mm -hmm. The whole, the larger scene isn't as much in our mind. And so how are we keeping an awareness of the bigger world mm -hmm. with young children? with adults who are so busy with trying to keep their families going well. Mm -hmm. And so that's where I find the kind of challenge, how do we speak to that? Mm -hmm. And that's more a rhetorical question than an awareness on my part. I'm, I, I, the reality is virtually every Mennonite congregation <laughs> I have visited has international I mean, there is, it is not that we are completely naive or blind to our international connections. So whether it's refugee resettlement or MCC or short-term service, I mean, there is an awareness of the world. I think my encouragement would be to take Men I World Conference seriously and, and ask yourself what, you know, I know budgets are tight, but Men at World Conference, we have 2.2 Mennonites in the world, and the center of Mennonite World Conference is in the second story of a nondescript little building at the edge of Bogota, Colombia. And I think there are maybe 7.2 FTE uh, staff for a, which is fine, which is about right, we shouldn't have, you know, I was connected with a Seventh-day Adventist recently, and if you go to Maryland, you will see a glistening, huge building that is their center. Uh, it'd be the Lutherans in Geneva, most expensive city in Europe, have a huge center. The Reformed Church has a huge center. We've done it about right. We've kept it modest. But, <laughs> but it's, too, it's too important to be forgotten. And so I would really... If, if every Mennonite group that's part of Mennonite World Conference would, would contribute the cost of one noon meal, that's how we framed it, one noon meal a year. So wherever you live, whatever your scale of economic status is, contribute one fast for one noon meal. That would make Mennonite World Conference meet its budget. And I taught it to North Americans, and that seems that doesn't seem like too big of a stretch. But um, but I know it's hard. Budgets, church budgets are tight. But I'd say, ask yourself: Is is a Mennonite World Conference in your in your budget? In the fall, there is Peace Sunday, and uh, in January, there's World Fellowship Sunday. Integrate that into your. Um, into your the, the rhythm of your church year. World Fellowship Sunday is the Sunday closest to January 21, mm -hmm. which is the mm -hmm. date commemorating the first baptisms. That would be something to consider. Okay. 
start planning now to go to Indonesia. 2021 is the next General Assembly. Um, it's always amazing to see people from all over the world gather at those assemblies. This will be a few ideas. Does your uh, focus on global uh, perspective uh, integrate with the SST program at all? Do you have any connection with planning those activities? Or One of the real challenges has been that the study service term, that's a semester in the um, general education program at Goshen College where students live in another country, um, that program has also been challenged by the shifting demographics. So the SST program is contracting. And for whatever reason, um, the leaders of SST have not always sought to connect as the first impulse with Mennonite groups. They've tended to say, okay, where's a, where's a setting that works? MCC sometimes has been a partner, but Mennonite congregations have not. That changed in Tanzania, and it's changing in Indonesia. So we have units in Tanzania every three years, and in Indonesia every three years. And there we've worked from the beginning with the local congregations. But that's a new thing. And hopefully it will grow. I hope so, very much. You know, in China, there's, no, there, there's not an obvious partner church to work with in the same way. Um, I think finding ways that you identify people in your church who have international experience, and, and you do this already, I'm sure, but to just be attentive to the points of connection that are already there. Honor the stories that people bring with them from outside of our setting. Well, um, there's a list in our bulletin this there's week. There's a list in our bulletin tomorrow oh, as you begin to think about global. So I began to wonder knowing that we have people who have been beyond the U.S., mm -hmm. what is the list we have? Just myself, I was able to come up with 20 countries, I think. The list has grown because we put the request out, so it's printed. Wonderful. Uh, and I want that somehow to raise attention to the fact that we have people who have been some places in service, mission, Connections of some sort. Mm -hmm. What? It's a conversation starter. Mm -hmm. So we'll see. It's great. And we didn't list all the places SST students have gone. Mm -hmm. So. Mm -hmm. So as the next step, are you going to get stories from all of those? <laughs> <laughs> I was looking for a breather, maybe, in a couple months. <laughs> yes, you've been working hard. If people just wrote their own stories, but you know, for us to pull memory stories just for this 125 years, that didn't happen easy. Sure. But there's more there than I even knew about, but it's not a big book. There are stories. Mm -hmm. Well, since, since I've gotten to know Gloria, I've become aware of storytelling in a, in a different way. Mm -hmm. And it's not easy. It is not easy to tell your own story. And I'm finding that out. I'm trying to do that. But you know, one of the things that helps is if you have an audience. Mm -hmm. And it's part of what my role is and what I do is that I receive the yeah. stories. They're not mine. Yeah. But it makes a huge difference if someone is receiving the story well, I think you're right. right when it's happening. Yeah. So, I mean, mm -hmm. everyone says, oh, I'm going to write my book. Well, but how far have you got? <laughs> <laughs> so, so my, what I've said to people is, can we just try this? Can we sit down for just an hour, one hour, and I'll just, I'll do what I do. Mm -hmm. yeah. And at the end of an hour, we will stop the tape recorder and I will say, are we further than we were an hour ago? How is this feeling? And the answer is, oh my goodness, yes, yes, of course it works. <laughs> of course it works because, well, there are many reasons, but one of the reasons is because you seriously need someone to receive that yeah. story. Mm -hmm. I, I think Not judgmentally, mm -hmm. just uh, just pour uh -huh. it out. Yeah. It's great. Yeah, I agree, Gloria. That, that's really important. But it takes someone like you 
here I am. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> about these Mennonites who don't seem to want to do this. <laughs> Well, thank you for your, your interest and patience. Um, I, I, I'm just very, very impressed with what I see happening here and wish you energy and courage to keep going forward. I know you feel at the end of these events exhausted, but know that there's another generation coming along that someday will pick up what We're you do. So. And, and, yeah. Well, what I say to people who reach somewhere about <coughs> 55 and they'll say I'm, I'm beginning to think about this and I said well yes in your early years you're raising a family you're working with their schedules you're trying to survive to keep things going well there's only so much you can handle mm -hmm. and there comes another point of life when you can begin to think about what is the story behind and hopefully you still have some older than you to ask them and then very quickly you realize Okay, that's a question I would have asked my grandfather. It's a question I would have asked mm -hmm. my mother. Yeah. Funerals that people just, oh, I was going to ask them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. What is the story of this grandfather who became a dunkard? Mm -hmm. And I'm not sure his family name runs strong mm -hmm. in any Anabaptist setting. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, thank you. Yes, thank you. People can make all of them. If you need something.